Hello everyone and welcome to this episode, the senior management one of the Women Talking About Learning podcast. I'm Andrew Jacobs. We're delighted to be back after our festive break and we'd love to wish you a happy new year for 2024. We have some amazing topics coming up this year, which we know you're going to be looking forward to listening to. Our first episode of this year is the senior management one, and we have two fantastic speakers. Our first guest is Joe Royce. Joe is an accomplished leader with deep expertise in brand building, organisational change, culture, and professional development. Joe is adept at leadership, building culture, and delivering creative and innovative solutions. She's led, managed, coached, and trained numerous executive teams, graduates, and interns. She's a huge advocate for DEI, sustainability, and triple bottom line business strategy. Our next guest is April Petri. April is not just a seasoned L&D professional with over 20 years' experience. Her journey is marked by significant roles in both mature companies and dynamic startups, and her passion lies in creating learning environments that do more than meet standards. They're there to revolutionise how individuals and organisations develop and grow. This is a fantastic conversation which I was really privileged to be able to listen to. I'm delighted to be able to bring to you now. This is Women Talking About Learning. This is Joe and April talking about senior management. Hi, Joe. Hey, April. How are you doing? I'm doing really well today. How are you? Yeah, good. Thank you. Good. Um, I think very much in the it's so nearly Christmas or festive break kind of mode, which can mean two things, right? Either you're busy because everyone suddenly wants to do something before the break and or um, everyone's a little bit kind of and energy is dipping, but, but all good. <laughs> How about you? Yeah. <laughs> Experiencing professionally, we're tidying down a little bit. Everybody's, oh, we'll just meet after the first of the year. But mm. personally, of course, it's concerts and rehearsals and recitals and yeah, yeah, decorating. All that good stuff. <laughs> yes. Hibernation is setting in. It's getting quite dark quite early. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. For sure. <laughs> so tell me, tell me, what have you been up to recently in, in the learning and development world? Yeah, I, you know, the thing I love the most about learning and development is really, you know, the, the never ending learning that you get to do. And um, I think my favorite thing I've done in the last quarter has been uh, attending DevLearn mm-hmm. um, and, and speaking about startups there and really getting to talk to folks that are experiencing um startup learning and development because it's quite different than a mature company or even even an early IPO company. Uh, what, what have you been uh, into lately? Yeah, um, interesting. And so also, um, also doing quite a lot of work with founders and startups and partially around L&D. But interestingly, that the, the initial conversation has often just been about you know, hey, we need a bit of help or um, we're thinking about our growth or we need to plan for next year, you know, all, all the kind of um, the, the usual business challenges. And then it very quickly gets into opening up the L&D conversation, because, as you say, if anyone needs that support, it's startups. I would love to know a little bit more into what you're talking about there with, you know, everything really does tie back to L&D. Uh, and uh, what I have heard from vendors, what I've heard from from founders and first employees is, you know, we don't have time for learning and development. Um, and, you know, what have you been experiencing with those conversations you're talking about, um, you know, sprinkling that L&D into those early conversations with a company? Yeah, uh, good, good question. Um, because I think, um, and I, I, I do think, um, and hey, we're both L and D professionals in some capacity, right? I mean, that that's that's a big chunk of kind of who we are, what we do. But I still think L and D as a term is quite problematic, because what I see it trigger in big corporates is training. <laughs> that means we need training. We need uh, we need a workshop. You know, we need. Um, uh, I don't know, an offsite or, or what have you, all of which is great stuff, but is not necessarily strategic and is not necessarily rooted in business strategy, is not necessarily rooted in the individuals and their needs and their development uh, potential and so on. So 
that on the one hand with big corporates and on the startup side, I think more often than not, the, the term L&D doesn't even come up. It's more a, hey, we think we've got a people challenge or how do we grow the team or um, these behaviors are going on or there's some funky leadership styles going on. So, so I guess in that capacity, I would try and focus it around people their needs, their motivations, and how to really sort of unlock the potential of, you know, each individual becoming greater than the sum of of, of the parts, basically. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What, yeah. What, what about for you? What, what, tell, me, tell me about Devlin as well. That, that must have been full of startups and founders and it was, but not necessarily in the uh, the audience. They were they were in the the floor. Right. Um, and you know, our our topic today is really about senior management. And I love what you were just talking about with like working with the founders. And um, I experienced this at DevLearn too. Is um, oftentimes when you're in that environment, and you know, you're the leader because sometimes by default you're the only person yeah. in in the team yeah, right yeah, yeah, yeah. team of yeah, one yeah. Yeah. <laughs> party of one <laughs> l and d um and what i find is a lot of these founders are really focused um or have experience in mature companies and they'll view product as innovative and let's take chances and they'll look at their sales teams and say the same thing and be like well we want to be different but when it comes to kind of the internal operations, which we tend to fall into, it's no, no, no. I'm just going to tell you what I need. Yeah, I, I don't yeah. need you to be innovative and I don't need you to work differently. Um, and that was one of the biggest uh, challenges I've had to overcome as as the leader or, or founding member of an L&D team is, hey, um, you want to be different, you have to kind of be different everywhere. Um, and I appreciate you coming to me with these ideas and I'm not going to say no, but I need a little more thought behind it versus I need a web, I, I need a webinar, I need an onsite, I need learning on L&D, you know, digging in there about what's the pain that you're feeling here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Interesting. Is one of the biggest struggles that I've found um, being in the leadership or the only L&D role. Yeah, 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 for sure. And I think um, that speaks to some really interesting themes around, I mean, I guess part of it is what can happen in terms of L and D generally, maybe regardless of the kind of the, the company context, which is it can get compartmentalized or it can become a bit of a sort of, oh yeah, we must do some of this, bit of a box ticking, um, you know, hey, let's throw in some uh, some learning and development kind of benefits alongside bonuses and so on. Yeah. Um, and I think that's exempt that's um exaggerated in in a startup context. So that's even more uh, the case. But I also think, it, which you sort of touched on there in terms of the, the the line of sight, the perspective and the kind of the capabilities, I guess, of the founder and someone who's perhaps an incredible scientist or product designer or tech uh, person, you know, tech developer or, or what have yeah. you, is not necessarily um, an incredible leader, is not necessarily an incredible manager and may not be necessarily people centric so so there are aspects that, that need to be sort of um seen and understood and, and learned ultimately so yes yeah, it's, it's a really interesting yeah. yeah that kind of all comes together in a very acute sort of sense doesn't it in that startup uh founder context for sure Yes. Uh, I love that tack you're taking there with who the founder is, because especially early in these startups or even in companies that are just experiencing hyper growth. And, yeah. you know, I, I tend to focus on that because that's really where a lot of my, you know, L&D leadership has come from, uh, whether it was a small company or a new company uh, or a company that may be acquired and they're kind of forming a new identity. Um, learning and development, um, you know, it's a structure. Mm -hmm. it's, um, I, I've heard a lot of people, and even at DevLearn, it was, well, you know, we have to be a profit center. And I was going, do you? Do you <laughs> right. have to be a profit center? <laughs> um I understand the desire to be seen as a positive 
uh, influence on on income, right? Especially when you're in these startups and you know the boards and the VCs are looking so closely. Um, but I've asked, you know, one of the things that changed the way I approach senior leadership in the in the company, um, as well as the team management leaders, has been how do we position what this team does mm -hmm. in the company? Um, and I, I was hired into a 10 year old startup and I was like, can you explain this to me? How are you a 10 year old startup? Right. right. Mm -hmm. And, and they were like, well, we massively, so we, we were doing business this way and our client was the consumer and now we've completely overhauled and we're actually doing B2B now. So they kind of were a new company, even though their product hadn't changed and they came in and their very first question, my second day on the job, they did an all hands and they said, so, you know, what do you do oh, here? <laughs> right? And I said, oh my gosh, that's such a great question. I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> and I said, I'm a bee. And they said, what do you mean you're a bee? I said, well, I'm a bumblebee, right? And I look at each of your teams and all of your folks is a garden. And, and like my job as a little bumblebee is to go around and collect all these little bits of pollen that are important and bring it back to the hive. And like, I do my magical learning stuff and turn it into energy and information and then put it back out to you to sustain the company. That's lovely. And so, thank you. Mm. <laughs> and, and just positioning it that way, especially with leadership, I found is saying, please stop looking at us like we have to produce a thing. Because when you look at us as deliverable producers, you're actually losing the magic of what the structure of L and D can be within a company. Completely. And so I've, that's, that's been my approach from that point on. I've also used recipes, you know, Yeah, nice. um, have you had an experience yet with a company that says, Oh, we have a group learning and everybody just makes their videos and puts them here. Yeah. And now everybody can learn from the person who knows the thing the most. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, Honestly, having worked in sort of, you know, like, like you, um, companies big and small and sort of startup and, and sort of everything in between. So seeing some of the um, some of the kind of classic challenges, I guess, that, that seem to be um, persistent are that the classic <laughs> one in, in corporate, um, like regardless of the, the level that you're kind of the, the audience the, that you're catering to or you're in service to. There's, we've got loads of learning content over here. We need someone to curate it and then we need to send people to it or we need to incentivize them even worse to, to, to do it and to engage with it. So uh, to your point, that's where you've kind of created a product in a vacuum, right? And then you have to retrospectively find your audience and encourage them to engage with it and to have any interest in it whatsoever, let alone to kind of engage with it in a sense that is practical and they can apply to their work and, and further their thinking and so on. So I think, um, I guess the, the lovely opportunity that, that we have working with startups, however sort of well or less well established is there tend to be fewer barriers. There tends to be, of course, much less red tape. There are less formal processes and, you know, it may well be kind of fewer departments or divisions or just generally a, less complexity and a bit more agility and, and kind of momentum I think if you can have that conversation and I and I absolutely love the way that you sort of painted that very visual human um, and sort of creative picture which is you know what learning and development can do which is really unlock the motivation and the talents of all of the individuals within that business then it's seen as a business benefit from the get-go it's not seen as a kind of separate thing. It's not seen as a kind of, yeah. you know, show up with your sort of juggling balls and do a, a magical workshop and then go off until the next workshop. It's it's there in the business and you're part of the business strategic conversation and the people conversation, which I think is, is absolutely key. I love that point so much that you're bringing in there is the, the business conversation. Um, you know, as I grew up in L and D, um, a lot of my experience came through sales enablement, 
Um, so I was a little bit more geared towards sales and marketing, um, which is a little different than like an HR track where you're in compliance and you're, you're training benefits and they're all important, right? Um, but one of the things that I found, especially, you know, when you're the only or the new or, you know, the newest uh, leader in the company is making sure that your L&D team is in sync and locked into what the business is trying to accomplish right now. Yeah. Um, and one of the frustrations I've really had in the learning industry has been, you know, this, the, the um, you said it, the take the information, go build the thing and then come back and give it to everybody. Um, and what we're finding is, you know, products, especially software, but, but, actual products and services that are that are being created you know every agile agile's almost old now right there's there's even newer ways of development and if we're stuck in addy and waterfall you know we are so far behind yeah 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 and and releasing that kind of learning when you're so far behind a puts a strain on the department because now we look like we're really not bringing benefit you know our honey honey doesn't actually get old but you know we have moldy honey now nobody wants it right like and and talking to you know the c-suite and the leadership team and saying look you may have never had a a learning person um involved with your c-suite um and here's why that's important um and sometimes i've been successful in in getting that through Uh, and sometimes they're like nope we'll tell you what we need from you and you know i just continually you know hit that note and say look i need to move as quickly as you move but if i'm getting information two weeks after you've made this decision and now you need the thing you know i can't you know learning doesn't just magically create itself totally totally right and And i think yeah. yeah sorry go on yeah I was just gonna. I was just gonna add. I think if you if you um, if you sort of compare and contrast that scenario with the fact that in so many businesses, they at, at some point in their kind of evolution will identify that they're too far removed from their customers, right? Particularly those on the sales and the marketing yes. side, because complexity, tools, platforms, reporting, metrics. You know, the day to day is so intensely overwhelming. That ninety percent of, of a sales or a marketer's role may well be internal, which is mm-hmm. ridiculous, right? You, you, you need to be right. with your customers, whether they're retailers or, or kind of human customers. Um, and uh, <laughs> uh, and I think you know it kind of makes me wonder whether, in the same way that business generally, thank goodness, is finally catching up to the notion of a circular economy and regenerative practices, as opposed to you know profit profit revenue and profit is kind of is everything i think um the same sort of i don't know ideology shift applying the circular economy to l d would make a huge amount of sense because it's about frugal innovation you know you can you can do a huge amount without having to spend too much time or too many resources um or, or certainly kind of financials on it you need to harness the power of the crowd and the internal specialists and experts and different perspectives that exist as opposed to kind of sheep dipping people into something that's been created externally and you absolutely need to create that sort of lovely flow in terms of people having a learning experience or finding new knowledge and then processing it applying it doing something with it you know trying trying something out and then starting again that which is continuous learning I guess but but in the in the sort of the notion of how we use people's time and resources and, and ensure that, that that isn't, to your point, just a linear process kind of comes from the top and sort of slowly cascades down. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I do. I, I, I'm so excited to have this conversation. Um, <laughs> and, and, and I wonder even if it's because both of us have that startup experience that it's so easy, you know, three months into a company that is, you know, just, they're just doggy paddling with like the water line just above their (laughs) lip. Right. And, 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 and you feel that urgency and you feel that, um, that need to be so relevant. 
uh, with the client, whether the client's internal or external. Um, I loved your term, frugal innovation. I wrote it down and I'm totally going to use that. Um, because... and by the way, that's not, my, that's not mine. I, <laughs> okay. I, it, it's come from a sustainability kind of learning that I'm uh, enjoying at the moment, but it, but it's, it's awesome. Like the principle of what, what can you do differently or adapt or do more of with less or with nothing, <laughs> which I love. Yeah. A hundred percent. And, you know, using your resources wisely, uh, whether you're in a mature company or in a startup environment, um, you know, who has spare anything these days, spare money, spare time, spare resources, you know, nobody does. Um, and I really think that, you know, being in, in these startups, like, you know, um, it, it's helped me structure um, the way that I do business uh, because I want to focus on being able to give you what you need uh, with the tools you already have. I don't want to, I don't want you to have to, um, buy an LMS if it's not in your budget. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so it, just that concept. So being frugal with all of your resources, keeping the company involved with learning, right? We're not the experts on everything, no. which is another conversation to have yeah. with senior leadership. Definitely. Yeah, <laughs> have definitely. you had the experience of, well, you're L&D, you should know everything. You should oh, know how yeah. the whole product works. You should know all of our clients. You should know. Oh, and yeah. you're like, for, for my sure, brain is big, but I, not that big. I may be clever, but um, yeah, no, it, for exactly sure, for sure. And I think I think that um, it also highlights the uh, not not only is that sort of completely unrealistic that you know any one individual can know absolutely everything that you might need to be kind of taking to an organisation, but I think um, it kind of it speaks to or maybe kind of leads to the notion of you know when when senior leaders. Uh, when senior leaders have L and D experiences, trainings, and so on, certainly in the kind of again the the bigger corporations, more often than not they are removed from the mass. <laughs> they're, they're kind of a special, separate bubble. Kind of they get their own. Place. Yeah, they get their own yeah. learning. They get their own learning, right? And mm -hmm. and of course there is um, you know there there are questions of sensitivity or kind of specifics of of levels of business insight that may be appropriate only to that room and not to kind of anyone else in the organization however it kind of sends entirely the wrong message about continuous learning learning from anywhere and everywhere the importance of different perspectives how anyone and everyone can enrich each and one another um and is often ironically i think counterbalanced by a sort of reverse mentoring if you're lucky yes um but rather than what about, you know, not, not every time perhaps, but the, the joy and the value of a mixed cohort for, you know, mm -hmm. different people with different perspectives, different degrees of, of kind of experience from different parts of the organization, particularly when you can do that super easily in a startup context. I think it's just so valuable because it's about increasing curiosity, enriching human experience, and that's at the core of good learning, you know, not a 55-page take away sort of you know keynotes and powerpoint slides for goodness sake so yeah yeah yes oh <laughs> oh joe i couldn't agree anymore um I, I, it sounds like you've had this conversation i i don't think i've ever worked for a company that has not said learning is one of our core values oh exactly right? yeah right and of yeah. course it is but yeah. how are you showing that um and in the startups i've worked with exactly the same conversation right like you know i had a i had our ceo very frustrated you know we made this program everyone said they needed it we made this program we involved everyone in taking it and you know the the show rates for it we're low. And of course, the first response is, well, we're going to make it part of their pay plan. And I was like, please stop using learning as a punishment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Right? <laughs> that doesn't work. Did it no. work for you in school? It's not going to work no. here. No. And I said, you know what would be really great is if a senior me, you know, a senior member of the leadership team came to these learnings. Right. Yeah. Because you're telling me that learning is critical. And it's, you have to show this. Um, and it wasn't a very fun conversation to have. 
you know, <laughs> they were t- quite taken aback of, well, I'm the founder and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I know, do you know how powerful that would be? Yeah. And um, I took to comparing learning with product development because that's oh. the, that's their that's their power spot right nice. they that's their baby is the product and so i would they, they you know it was i was the only lnd person for a company i was a 250th uh employee i was there for 26 months and we were at um 1500 internationally by the time i left wow and so for the first, I think, 13 months, I was the only L&D person in the entire company, internal learning, external learning, the whole kit and caboodle. And, you know, I kept going to, and I reported to the um, senior director of design, as in software design, because why not? You know, that's <laughs> sure. the person that had bandwidth. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and so I you know, I was the only person. So I was creating and delivering and measuring and reporting and like all the things right on software and processes and blah, blah. And they kept saying, we need more, we need more. And I finally sat him down one day and I was like, sir, director, um, you design product, right? Yes. I said, would you ever have one person do your discovery with your clients, um, code it, write, you know, write the requirements, write the code, do the QA, run the meetings with the people, you know, to validate the software and then follow up with the customers. He was like, oh my God, no. And I said, what do you think we're doing in learning? Oh, good for you. I love that. Love that. And he said, I never thought about it that way. I said, we're producing a product and we have all the same steps. And that's when they finally started to realize, oh, oh, this isn't just accounting, right. you know, right. where right. you do the thing. It's a creative process. Mm, that's really nice. That's, that's, um, and when you, when you can, when you can help someone to, to understand in that, in that way, when the penny kind of drops, um, that's a, that's a great moment because then you're, then you're having a truly sort of developmental conversation as peers, um, yes. as opposed to L and D somehow sort of being, in service to to people who, who don't necessarily make time for it themselves or yeah don't don't value it as much as they could so yeah that's that's um that's a really nice example actually really nice hmm. it it turned out right because he didn't know anything about L and D he knew all about UI he knew all about UX he was br- he was a brilliant had a patents on codes like he was a brilliant person um, and so we started having these meetings and I, I developed a little acronym because I'm in learning you have to have an acronym and it was called scream (laughs) this is my scream (laughs) and these are the things that have to happen Uh to make learning so your s is your strategy Uh right and it doesn't have to be long-term strategy it needs to be in pace yes with the company yes right so if we're running on two weeks I have a two-week strategy Um, and then we have c which is your creating I have to create the learning yeah. Right. So yeah. whether it's a whether it's a live learning, uh, a webinar, a recording, a PowerPoint, whatever, I'm making the I'm creating the thing. Yeah. And then we have to report on it, right? Because everybody wants to know what are the metrics, and that's sure. a whole nother yeah conversation, right? <laughs> and then you have the execution, right? You have to deliver it, whether you're putting it in the LMS, whether you're doing the live, whether you're onboarding somebody one on one. And then you have the administration of all of that. Yeah. You have to sign everybody up for the right courses. You have to make sure they're taking the tests. You, you know, the tests are being graded by the appropriate people. And then you have the M, which is the one I hated the most, which was maintaining the content, oh, yeah. um, especially product content, because we released every seven days, we did a new product release. And I was like, there's no way I can, we are always going to be 70% inaccurate. I am one person. And so we would sit down and I would say, okay, here's my scream report. <laughs> this is where I'm spending <laughs> all my time. Cool. I was spending all my time in execution. Yeah. And I was like, I can't keep making things if I'm always delivering. And that really, you know, as a leadership conversation kind of drove home my need for resources, whether they were new resources or giving me people inside and I still use that when, when I'm working with L&D teams today. I'll say, listen, I know this is going to sound crazy, but it's it's about the scream. 
It's great. It works. <laughs> yeah. It's you got to get up out of the, um, you know, deliverable mindset when you hit that leadership position. Yeah. Agreed. Totally agreed. And, and yeah, in, interesting that I guess I'm wondering, I'm curious about how uh, with leaders, with, you know, senior leaders working, whatever the organizational context, coaching is popular, is generally pretty well respected. Um, people understand the kind of, you know, simple premise of a one-to-one confidential uh, supportive conversation where you're sort of given the time and the space to, to find your own answers and so on. But how to, I don't know, how to perhaps bring coaching L and D conversations closer together, particularly when we're, we're thinking about sort of, you know, senior management in this context, how to, how to make that both to your earlier point, part of the boardroom, the strategic conversation, but also part of the individual's holistic wellness conversation, you know, as opposed to having um, wellness sit separately, HR sit separately, L and D sit separately, and if you're lucky, there might be some sort of coaching in there somewhere. It, it, again, it's sort of maybe back to the language thing and the positioning, which enables people to understand it in the best way, which is, you know, how do we, how do we elevate it to, I don't know, the, 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 the essence of kind of people development or, you know, the sort of human, human potential. I, I don't know. I, I don't know where I'm going with that really, other than I'm, I'm curious about how obviously language is, crucial to the value that people place on things how they understand it and of course where it sits in someone's mind and in an organization as well right yeah i i do love that um it 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 needs to be systemic right yes exactly. um, and and what i i love is you've got um a slightly different perspective because all of my companies have been us-based companies okay um, yeah. and you know we're quite notorious for what's the people become numbers right. and which is completely antithema to learning yeah, right of course. and when they want to start putting metrics on top of learning i have a really complicated relationship with with metrics, um, probably because I came up through software, right? And they want right. to, you know, click track everything. And I was like, I can tell you how long somebody sat and stared. I can tell you how long somebody played a video on their screen. That That is not learning, right? And getting that leadership to understand that learning is an internal process and you can only see behaviors, Right. Right. Um, honestly, I'm going to go like super high level here, Joe, and say <laughs> we like I feel like to get to that, we have to address the common misunderstandings and misconceptions about learning. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've heard. Well, I mean, I have a master's or I have a Ph.D. I like I've had so much school that of course I understand what learning is. And I'm like, cool, um, you've ridden in a lot of cars. Can you drive a race car? No, like, right. yes, it's right. in the same family, but it isn't the same thing. And really constantly driving home that learning is, it is not intrinsically measurable. Changes in behavior are measurable. Um, the measuring the resources you're putting into learning critical, but it is not learning. And, you know, I, I've, you know, some of the leaders that I've worked with are like, oh, I mean, I feel like you're splitting hairs. And I'm like, okay, well, again, let's get back to a metaphor. Let's compare it to something else. Like, you know, is grocery shopping making dinner? No, <laughs> it's <laughs> not. No, no, no. Um, so, you know, I love what you're saying there. And I, I, you know, really think it goes towards we've got to keep learning and changing that perception of learning. And, you know, whether we change the wording, like I, I, I think it was uh, J.D. Dillon was saying something about we've got to stop saying L&D. And I think you said yes. something earlier. And Great. What do we want to call it? Um, you know, what else do we want to say? Um, and getting them to understand that uh, learning is the culture of your company. 
I think that you can look at the at the attitude in the company towards learning and you will understand the culture of that company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Completely. Completely right. It's, um, yeah, and, and I, <laughs> I, won't, I, won't, I won't mention the company for obvious reasons, but um, the company that I work with that spent huge amounts of, you know, invested heavily in L&D and sort of learning platforms and so on, also by their own admission recognised that the complexity within the business was such that no one knew what anyone else did or how to work with them. And you kind of step back and you think, huh, if you could maybe sort of remove some of the friction and the barriers to people getting to know each other better in a professional context and getting to empathise with their respective skill or specialism or function, then you might find that a whole lot more learning and impact would be possible because people sort of, you know, less, as you say, less, less, um, less concerned with kind of scurrying through the day job and then, oh, I've got to do some learning at the end of it. And, and actually just seeing learning as an inherent part of everyday conversations, um, everyday experiences. Yeah. And yeah. And, yeah reframe. I love that. And, and Anthony's got here in the in the chat that says um, he's heard, heard someone the other day say, we don't do on the job, we do structured shadowing. And that really ties into exactly what you're saying here. And I think, you know, if we could, if we could lighten up on the measurement piece of it, which at the end of the day is going to put more responsibility on the manager, the, the direct line manager and their observation of how their employee is perf- I'm sorry <laughs> um, how their employee is is performing yeah um, that's the fight that I see they want the measurement to check the box to say well my person learned their thing but we're not seeing the result versus hey they learned the thing whether it was shadowing or a class um, but I'm still not seeing the performance and getting back into coaching and I apologize it's Andrew not Anthony um, <laughs> but yes that's yes. it all goes together to make it more human and I, I hate to say it, but a little less measured from a metric perspective and more of a live interaction between the manager understanding what their their direct report should be displaying and then being able to take action on that. Because learning is always the beginning of the journey. It isn't the end result. Completely, completely right. And I think to your, to your points about measurement, which I completely um share with you um your perspective you know measurement versus which always to me feels like in the L&D context box ticking to a degree or justifying you know the resources spent versus impact um so you know observing someone and how they're doing in their role or how they're showing up every day and how they are how they're interacting with their team, if they're a manager, certainly, you know, the impact they're having upon their team, how, how effective are they being? Um, and actually it's, it, it's, it's harder to kind of evaluate that versus a kind of financial spreadsheet, but my goodness, is it more palpable than any kind of spreadsheet could ever be? And, and, you know, it, it, it shows up in, in every sort of, every aspect of, of kind of working with that individual, I think. Um, so we have a question here, um, which uh, is, is senior management and learning a gendered issue? Oh my goodness, that's a biggie to drop, uh, Andrew. <laughs> it's a good question. <laughs> um, question. Perception, yes. Mm. I feel like leadership is predominantly men. Mm-hmm. Um, is it backed up by any any infer? Is it backed up by any statistics from my perspective? Not really, but um, you know, I'm a 47 year old professional, and I just got my first female leader. Um, as in, I directly reported to a woman um, right. two years ago. Right. Oh wow. Okay. okay. And it's because I've never reported to HR. Oh, okay. As an yeah. L and D leader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Ah. Yeah. 
I, I definitely, I definitely think, and I, and I, I won't name check in case it sort of um, goes beyond the, the boundaries of what we should cover here. But there are some really interesting businesses at the moment, for example, um, investing and supporting female founders exclusively. Um, and we, you know, we all know a lot about the exponential funding and investment that goes to male run startups versus female run startups based on absolutely no evidence of, of success or potential at all. Mm. But, you know, huge bias, huge bias or kind of legacy system, I guess. Um, yeah. And I think, I think what's interesting in the, in the context of senior leadership learning is if I'm honest, I have had, <laughs> I've had some, I think much richer and deeper learning experiences in all female cohorts mm -hmm. now whether that's because it happens to be the kind of the, the chosen focus and the subject matter whether it's because there's a greater degree of honesty because there's a, a certain degree of sameness uh, i.e around gender or whether it um if people kind of choose it themselves to, to kind of signal a greater psychological safety i don't know but um when when you can remove the day job posturing and ego yes. in any kind of learning context and, and of course that shows up quite a lot in senior senior leadership then i think you everyone has a richer experience of it and there's um but it's hard to do right hard to yeah. do mm. right because learning is inherently vulnerable For sure. and yeah. that is the the trigger that i have found with a lot of uh, specifically the male leadership. And, and we have a note here from Andrew that says data supports two thirds of senior leaders are men in L and D. Uh, but I would love to see what the individual contributor looks like because it is more than likely flipped, right? The right. women are the ones delivering and we can get into a lot of the social, you know, social reasons for that. Um, but what I have found is learning is vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And when you ask specifically men in high profile leadership positions to be vulnerable, attend the learning, ask the questions, lead and answer that they're not pre-prepared for, there is an enormous resistance to that. And I do think that affects the learning culture in the company. And I have yet to overcome it in a company and, and have that vulnerability shown. And I have had that very specific conversation with a founder and said, look, you have to be vulnerable in front of your people. You're asking them to be vulnerable. And now it's your turn to lead that way. And unless you are willing to say, I don't know, in front of all of your people, they're never going to be willing to say, I don't know to you. And that's what you're asking them to do. But if you always have an answer, they're going to feel like they always have to have an answer. Yeah. So, right. you yeah. know, the learning culture drives the company culture. And I think a lot of it is derived from the most visible leadership. And that does tend to be men. And I would love to work in a female founded startup. Yeah, I, me too. I would love to see the difference. <laughs> This this is our this is our advert to to uh, yes. as we bring this to a close. So we are we are available, female founders. Yes, you know where Please. to find us. <laughs> Come talk to us. We would love yeah. to know more. <laughs> love it. Oh, it's Joe, so thank awesome you. To connect. Yeah, thank you. Love this. Absolutely wonderful, and I would love to stay in touch. It sounds like we have some similar perspectives. For sure. Yeah. You take care. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. You might have noticed. There was talk about Christmas there. That's because this episode was recorded at the beginning of December. It was just great to hear from two really talented women with vast experience and knowledge of senior managing within learning and development. And a massive thank you to both Joe and April for their time in this recording and for giving us such rich content. There are, as usual, tons of links in the show notes for this episode, which took an age to produce, as well as all the contact details for Joe and April. We still have a few episodes recorded and those are being produced and ready to be published. And we're recording our next set of episodes shortly, which we hope you'll also listen to. 
for details of future topics and how to be a guest are all on the website and you can find the details in the show notes. Next time, it's the ROI one. As always, thanks for listening and we'll see you again soon.